how does a woman find a perfect man? I can, I can take you within 10 minutes from here for a little car ride, and I can introduce you to several perfect men in their behavior. Yes, I can do that. So it's too late for you, Linda, okay? Okay. Let me describe this, these, this group of men. They wake up every morning and pop out of bed at 5 a.m. This is true. They exercise vigorously daily and keep their bodies going. They make their own bed every day. Jordan Peterson says, don't change the world. You just go make your own bed. He cleans his room. He works hard. And I'm not kidding you. This is true. I can introduce this, some of these people to you. Does not touch alcohol. Helps out in the kitchen when required. Linda wants to keep me out of the kitchen. <laughs> Does not indulge in any kind of nightlife. It's not a spendthrift. It's always punctual. This person's always punctual. I can show you several people just like this. This group of men pray every day. And most of them read their Bible. And they hit the sack at 9 p.m. every day. You want me to take it to them? It's right down here, right out of the square. All these guys are in jail. <laughs> That's, you know, they have to live this way. They're living pretty, well, not all of them do that, but uh, if they're tr trying to be good and to get, get their sentences passed as pain painlessly as possible, this is how they do it. So if you were looking for a perfect man, uh, talk to the chaplain uh, back here in the back. <laughs> Jeff Bryant will uh, introduce you to some of these guys. <laughs> he sees them all the time. <laughs> So, here was a woman in the Bible that tried her best, it seems to me. I think she gets somewhat of a bad rap, but uh, she tried to find the perfect man six times. Six times. And she got a tarnished reputation because of that. Now, we don't know why these men in her life uh, absented themselves or divorced her or maybe some of them died. We don't know. But in the day of Christ, to get married more than three times was really frowned upon, even if under the best of circumstances. And so she had a tarnished reputation. And so she, she, she hardened in her life. She hardened up. And she said, I'm done with marriage. Five times after all. And uh, then she just started cohabitating with somebody. Don't need a marriage contract. I'm just going to live with this guy. And she did. And we meet her in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4 uh, we meet the woman at the well. And uh, we don't know too much about her. We never know her name. But she met Jesus at the well, at Jacob's well. Jacob's well is still there. You can go to it. And uh, maybe it's been rebuilt so over the centuries several times. But we don't know. But this woman goes to the well when all the other women are gone. Because she's probably not well liked. And looked down upon. You know there's nothing worse than religious. Um, uh, being better than thou. Maybe somebody did reach out to her. We don't know. But she went to the well. And it was 12 noon. When we encounter her. She's from Sychar, and 
she goes to the well one day. I'm just telling you the story. She goes to the well one day, and coming down the road, she, she spots a figure sitting on the rim of the well. That's new to her. People are usually in the shade or working or doing something else. But there, here's a, a man of that gender she's done with sitting on the edge of the well. And she's got her bucket. And don't think that this, she had a wooden bucket with a bug rope on it. It was a leather bag, basically. Just a leather bag they would let down into the well. Jacob's well is really deep and cool. And she took her leather bag. By the way, Jesus and his disciples probably had one of these leather bags to get water. They carried it in. But Jesus had sent his disciples off to Sychar to go get dinner, some food. All of them. I don't know why he sent all of them. I think he knew what was going to happen. In fact, I know he did. And he parked himself in her way. And so she sees this individual sitting on the edge of Jacob's well, and she's got to get some water. She doesn't want to encounter him. But Jesus is in her way, and so she makes a decision. She's just going to go get the water. And when she comes to the edge of the well, before she gets a chance to drop her leather bag into the water down deep, Jesus says to her, will you give me a drink? There's something so human and so much pathos about that. It's in the heat of the day. He's walked all morning. It's the sixth hour. He's waiting for the food to come back with his disciples. And he has nothing to, they, they no doubt had the leather bag with them. And so he says to the woman at the well, would you give me a drink? And I can see her. She's a tough gal. She's a tough gal. She's not afraid. A lot of women saw a stranger sitting on the edge of the well. They just wait till he left, but she's not her. <laughs> and so she looks at him. And I, th I think she had her hands on her hips, my, myself. And she says to Jesus, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a Samaritan woman for a drink. And you know, this, Jesus was thirsty. He wasn't playing. He, was, he wanted to drink of water. And this woman had the opportunity to give him a drink. I don't think that happened <laughs> because of the um, conversation as it developed between this woman and Jesus. He knew she was going to be at that well. It says in the, uh, the old King James, it says, Jesus and his disciples must needs go through Samaria. Well, what do you mean must needs go through Samaria? Well, that was the shortest way. But most Jews would take the long way around. So they didn't have to encounter any Samaritans whom they hated and were hated by the Samaritans. There were some exceptions. Jesus told the story of the good the Good Samaritan. You know, that flew in the face of the culture that he was telling that story to. The priest came down the road, the Levite, they're going to their religious meetings, and they pull their robes around him, and they see this guy wounded on the road. The Good Samaritan. And that's what this woman was. How is it that you, being a Jew, speak to me, a Samaritan woman, He knew that she would be there, and he put himself in her way. She, he sat on the edge of the well. She had to encounter him. She had to get proximity. Somebody said that they could hear the conversation. And Jesus says to her, oh, if you only knew the gift of God. And who's asking you for a drink? You would be asking him for a drink of living water. And 
when the Jews heard this term in the Bible, living water, it just means running water, fresh, pure, cold, not stagnant in a swamp or in a pool. It's running water. Jesus said, I have running water of life, if you only knew. And she got her hands on her hips, and she's, uh, she's argumentative. And she, she gets into a religious argument with him. And Jesus just goes toe-to-toe with her. Tough old gal she is. Some great artwork about this. <clears throat> And uh, she said, are you greater than our, our father Jacob who gave us this well? You say you need to go to Mount Zion in Jerusalem to worship. We Samaritans believe we, Mount Gerizim right here is where you should worship. You know, there's still that religion there today. They still have a high priest the Samaritans, the Samaritan religion, only a few hundred of them, but they have a high priest, they have a temple, they have their own scrolls, they believe in only the five books of Moses, and uh, they were settled in, they were convinced they were right and the Jews were wrong, vice versa. And then Jesus said this marvelous, wonderful sentence that just resonates in the depths of my soul, He said, woman, that's an endearing term. It's a term of of respect. He didn't say, hey, you. No, he said, woman. The hour is coming, and now is. When the true worshipers of God will worship him in spirit and in truth. It won't be in Mount Zion in Jerusalem. It won't be in Mount Gerizim. God is seeking such people to worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not where you worship, it's who you worship. And so it's got nothing to do with geography. By the way, listen to this. When Jesus encountered this woman, he parked himself in front of her on that, uh, remember that well. He crossed racial lines. He crossed Gender barriers. He was not supposed to be talking to a woman, a spiritual woman at at all. He crossed religious barriers, racial barriers, gender barriers, emotional barriers. Well, she had, she was pretty prickly for a while when she encountered Jesus. And political boundaries. Jesus crossed all of those boundaries to get to this one woman. What boundaries will Jesus and barriers will Jesus cross to reach you and me? To encounter us, to sit on the rim of our well, to get in our way and get in, us, get in our face and say, if you only knew, he's tantalizing her. If you only knew the gift of God and who's asking you for a drink, you'd be asking him to give you the living water, fresh, cool water from heaven. If all the metaphors in the Bible, water is the most ubiquitous. And he crossed that religious barrier and reached out to her, engaged her in a, in a conversation. It was a holy divine encounter that Jesus engineered so he could get through this one person. Jesus wants to encounter you too. And you say, well, I've always already encountered Jesus. Well, maybe it's, maybe it's time for another encounter. I encountered Jesus when I was 16 in Maysville, Kentucky. And I've met him around many street corners since. He's always surprising. You know, Jesus said the Father is seeking people to worship him in spirit and truth. I'm not going out seeking God. I'm dead in my sins and trespasses. I can't seek God. There's not a spark in me to do that. The Bible says God is seeking us 
we are not seeking God. We get this wrong. Christians get this wrong. Oh, I've got to work on my relationship with God. No, you don't. You just need to rest your heart in what has already been done for you. In glory. It's already done. You just need to fall into the arms of Jesus and let him do his sanctifying work. Because he will cross any boundary. The Father is seeking people to worship him. He wants to encounter you and me as well. So the conversation goes on with him and this woman. And there's this uh-oh moment. Jesus is very tender, very kind, tantalizing her with the idea of water from heaven to refresh her soul. I think he's the crack's coming. She, he's getting in. The crack in her hard veneer is beginning to open up now. She's beginning to hear. But Jesus, at that vulnerable moment, he ripped the scab off of the scars of her life. He said to her, go call your husband. Bring and come back. Well, that was, a, that was a, the protocol. He should have done that. And she should have done that. And she lied to him. Don't lie to Jesus. <laughs> she lied to him. I have no husband. And Jesus pulled the scab off of the festering sore heart that she had. And he said, you've had said that rightly because you've had five husbands. And now you're just cohabiting with someone. And then she went from this curt, how is that you being a Jew? Now she says, sir, Karios, sir, I see that you're a prophet. And then he, they got into conversation about the mountains and religion and so forth. She was trying to divert, but Jesus has her. He has her heart in his hands. He has her life exposed. There's no escaping the stranger on the well at, at Jacob's well, at Sychar. He encountered her and broke her heart and ripped the scab off of her life and exposed who she was. And it says she left her pot right where it lay, ran back to Sychar, I think it's a four or five miles, and she began to talk to the men of the city. Women probably wouldn't talk to her. And she said this, come see a man that told me my whole life. Come see a man that told me my whole life. And guess what happened? As the first Samaritan evangelist was a woman with a bad reputation. Wow. And in the meantime, the disciples come back and they see him talking with her and they're amazed. Number one, that he crossed all these boundaries, the racial, the, the gender, the religious, the emotional, the political boundaries. He crossed all of those to get her in his heart. And when she went to town, they came out and saw Jesus. And guess what happened? Many of them believed in Jesus. He stayed with them for two days. Unheard of. A Jewish rabbi hobnobbing, rubbing elbows with a bunch of Samaritans. No wonder the Pharisees hated him so much. <laughs> but, you know, Jesus doesn't care about that. He wants to meet you where you are and where I am. And expose our hearts too. Because Jesus, tender, meek, and mild. No. <laughs> Jesus can be ruthless. He can stomp his feet on the floor when he sees one of his people getting hurt. 
He said one time, it would be better for a millstone to be tied around your neck and thrown into the sea. Then let's not talk about meek and mild, tender Jesus. <laughs> no. He, in his ruthless, loving, tender way, changed this woman's life within half hour. I cannot believe that she would ever be the same. She became an evangelist immediately, and she told others about Jesus. How good and wonderful is that? A great story. There's more to that. By the way, she did meet the perfect man. She met the perfect man. And he changed her life because he really loved her and cared for her and honored her as well he should have. Are you thirsty? No doubt she had thirst in her life that she didn't realize she had. Sinclair Lewis was talking in one of his novels about um, a, a gentleman talking to his girlfriend and they're both miserable people. And she says to him, you know, looks, we're, look, we're different, but we're the same. We're both unhappy about stuff. We don't even know what we're unhappy about. We're both frustrated about things we don't know what we're frustrated about. There's this vague emptiness and frustration. And it's a perfect paragraph to describe the human heart without Christ. A vague longing for something that you don't even know what it is. Augustine said, Lord, you've made us for yourself. And we are restless until we rest in you. The Apostle Paul in Athens looked at the Greek philosophers and said, God put you where you are, one blood of all mankind, that you might seek him and find him. But you know, when we see God, we find that he is the one that's been seeking us all the time. God was never lost. I'm the lost one. He came to find me. And the Apostle Paul said to those Greek philosophers, in him we live and move and have our being. He's not far from any one of us. Let me give you some scripture. Turn it on. <laughs> Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Talk to the woman at the well. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's a beautiful discovery. She found out something, and so must we. When Jesus gives you the water of life, it whelms up in you. It doesn't hang around in a stagnant pond. Christians sometimes want to make it that way. The Spirit of God, the water of God is flowing. It's whelming. It's refreshing. It's changing. And then he says to her, yet a time is coming, and now has come. Here we are today. Jesus says to her, don't worry about Zion. Don't worry about Mount Gerizim or who's got the right temple. Yet a time is coming, and now has come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It's not where you worship. It's who you worship and how you worship. You can worry, David said it this way, if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. There's no escaping. Jesus is going to sit on the well of your well, the rim of your well, 
too and encounter you in your life. Because that's the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Here I am, Lord, find me. I know you're looking for me. I'm done hiding. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. The, the woman said, I know that Messiah, Tahik, was the uh, Messiah of the of the um, Samaritans. And their tradition was when the Messiah came, he would unveil all mysteries. And she said, the woman said, I know when Messiah called Christ to come, when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus said this, Ego imi. Ego imi. I am, I am two ways. I, the one speaking to you, am he. Have you found the Messiah? Jesus wants to be your personal Messiah. Sir, I know. I know Messiah is coming. And he'll unveil all mysteries and Jesus looked her in the eye no doubt leaned a little closer, her heart still throbbing with the pain of exposure, and says to her, Ego imi, it is I, it is I. I am the one you're talking about. At that point, I can see she, back, she must have backed up, dropped her leather pail, ran off to sidecar, and began to tell other people about this wonderful Jesus that she met at Jacob's well. You, Christian, have a wonderful Messiah. He's your Messiah. He's come. Fall into his arms. That's all we need to do. In John chapter 7, on the last greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. King James says, whosoever will come to me. This is one of the whosoever's in the Bible. Anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink, says Jesus. Are you thirsty in your soul? Christians get that way. We get dry, we get stuck. We get irritable and angry and we forget the one who loves us. Are you thirsty? Whoever believes in me, says Jesus, whosoever believes in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit. whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Is the Holy Spirit active in your life? Is the Holy Spirit flowing in your life? Is he the river of running water for you? Revelation chapter 21 verse 6. God's talking. He said, he said to me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, to the thirsty. Not to the religious. Not to the perfect. To the thirsty. I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Then the angel showed me a river in chapter 22 of the water of life clear as crystal hallelujah see this vision this metaphor flowing from the throne of God and from the land down to the middle of the street of the city that's a future thing but it's a future reality that we experience today 
take it. Let the river flow over you. Let the Niagara Falls of the Holy Spirit just bathe your life. Jesus, the water of life, is our absolute need for real life. You've got to have him. There's this woman lived in tenements in New York all over her life, raised a passel of kids and never left the streets, the dirty streets of New York. And she never, never went out of the tenement places where she lived. But somehow she got connected with the senior citizens group. Lo and behold, they packed her on a bus and they took her to the ocean. She'd never been there. She stepped her, sand, her feet on the white beach and she looked at the ocean and she said, finally, I see something that's enough. <laughs> she never had enough of anything, but she had enough. Jesus is enough for you. He's enough for me. He's all we need. He's our absolute need for our real life. Jesus, the living water, is our most available supply. Whosoever is thirsty, not whosoever is perfect, forget that. Whosoever is thirsty, let him come to me and drink, says Jesus. It's our most ample and available supply of life. That's our Lord Jesus. Jesus, the word of life, our only real way to soul satisfaction. I don't care what else you drink. Well, I kind of do care what you drink, but then. Uh, but there's nothing, bar none, like a cold glass of water on a hot day. I'm not sure where we get our water, but people in San Francisco drink water from Hetch Hetchy. People in New York City drink the beautiful water that comes from the Finger Lakes. An idyllic place, pure, wonderful water. And so you and I have soul satisfaction because we're drinking from the water of life in your soul. Take it. Quit trying to earn it. Receive it. Don't try to bargain for it. It's already yours. The work is done by the blood of Jesus. Your soul can be satisfied in him like no other, like that cold draft of clear crystal water when you're thirsty in your body. Your body is mostly water. Even the, even the uh, person on your teeth, cutting your teeth, has got water in it. Your muscles are mostly water. You need water. So do I. But there's a soul searching thirst that is only sufficient. I don't know. Here we go. Can you hear me now? <laughs> As Nick Schell says. He satisfies the soul like no other. Jesus, the water of life, flows ever new throughout our entire life. There's no bottling Jesus. You're not going to carbonize and put a cap on him because he's running water it's fresh new clean and pure throughout our entire life. Beloved, when you feel stuck and dry, just picture the pure river flowing out of the throne of God down through the ages into your life, meeting you at the rim of your well, confronting you and bringing you a new life in him. 
day by day. And it'll be different next year than it is today. Yes. Because he is that kind of Lord. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for helping us eavesdrop and see the picture of how you orchestrated at this divine appointment with this one woman whom you loved. In your ruthless love, you changed her. And Father, we pray that Jesus will do that with us as well. Pure, clean, living water rush over my soul. Can you say amen? Stand with me, would you? I can tell you, I got on fire with this word. I thought I knew something about the woman at the well. Now I know something about the woman at the well. He is Lord, he is Lord, he is risen from the dead, and he is Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ And he's my Lord, he's my Lord, he is risen from the dead, and he's my Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's sing an amen to that. Amen. And now may the grace of God, the love of Christ, the communion of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you now and forever. Go in peace. Have a great week. Voting members, please stay and Cast your ballot. I'm going to let Rob take it from here.